Thank you, everybody. Um, again, my name is Hillary Kenyon, and I am a certified lake manager and a limnologist for Applied Watershed Sciences. And I will be giving you guys an update on the watershed-based plan process for Farm Pond. And I'm also going to go over some water quality data from 2023 to give you a peek into what you're gonna see in the eventual report. Can you see my cursor right here if I go up here? Maybe. Yes. Okay, because I'm gonna try to use it as a pointer. So I've separated this presentation into two parts. Uh, uh, the whole first part of the presentation is going to go over watershed dynamics and everything related to watershed loading. The second part, I'm gonna go more into cyanobacteria bloom dynamics and in lake water quality and try to walk you guys through some of the figures that you're gonna see in the reports. So overall, Farm Pond has a watershed that's roughly about 410 acres. This image on the right demonstrates the watershed area polygon around on farm pond. So that means that when it rains, anything that falls within this area is going to either run directly off via stormwater or it's going to infiltrate into the shallow soils and go directly to farm pond. Um, the watershed area relative to the volume of farm pond and relative to the surface area of farm pond is a pretty small ratio. So if you think about it from a geological time span, the small watershed area relative to the large volume of farm pond, because it is fairly deep, sort of predisposes it to have excellent water quality over time. So watersheds that are very large don't have the same opportunity to have very, very low nutrients for thousands of years like farm pond does. Um, in situations where you have a more rivering system, flushing rate is very, very high. Whereas if you have a small watershed like Farm Pond, your flushing rate is only about 0.4 times per year. Um, that means that it's flushing slowly. A lot of times you're not gonna have very much outflow, which is what we've seen in the summer periods where the berm that I've drawn in over here was overtopping this spring, but in late spring last year, there, there was no nothing flowing over the berm. So that means it's basically any nutrients that are coming from the watershed are then settling in farm pond and not going anywhere. And they'll settle to the bottom and to some degree, they will be internally recycled. And I'll explain that as we go along. Okay, so this is a quick review of basically what a watershed plan is. At its core, it's meant for identifying and controlling nutrients from non-point source pollution. So your non-point source pollution sources are gonna be diffuse sources as opposed to point source pollution, which is something like a wastewater treatment plant. Non-point source pollution is everybody, everywhere. Very small sources of erosion, very small sources of stormwater runoff, fertilizer use in private gardens and private property. And all of the nutrients that come from these small sources add up to the total watershed load from non-point sources. In general, strategic land use conservation is the best way to preserve water quality over time and to minimize the impacts of development. Impervious cover is um, a concept that's sort of self-explanatory, but generally when you have a natural condition a large percentage of the rain that falls is going to be able to infiltrate into the soil, travel through the soil via shallow groundwater and make way to farm pond. But when you have development, even low density residential development, some of the runoff is going to be um, going directly to the pond. So impervious cover comes in two classes. You have directly connected impervious cover, which means that it's going from a roof gutter to a street, to a storm drain, to the pond, which you only have a couple of those directly connected sources. And then you have uh, disconnected or not directly connected impervious cover, which means that the roof runoff is going into a detention area on someone's property and eventually infiltrating. But what it does is it still concentrates that runoff into um, a higher volume of water and trying to infiltrate it in a smaller space, a smaller surface area. And that, that sometimes can increase water velocity, increase erosion issues. Um, and sometimes in really large storm events, it overwhelms the capacity and will continue to run off via overland flow. 
The watershed based plan has those nine minimum elements that I spoke about in the first presentation, uh, just to make sure that we check all our boxes with EPA and that there's some sort of standard across these in the country. In Massachusetts, there's a very specific model that we are required to use uh, that was developed by MassDEP and Geosyntec consultants, and it's a tool that estimates using land use loading coefficients how many nutrients are coming from certain types of pollution um, and certain types of land use in your watershed. But I think I spoke about this just a little bit before, I'm going to detail it now. Watershed loading loading models um, can really only get you so far. So I ran through the watershed loading tool um, from MassDEP, and it came up with that farm pond has no problems and it's meeting all water quality goals, uh, which if you are on the lake and you've seen the cyanobacteria blooms that happen periodically, you can tell that that's not always the case and that there's something else at play. So regardless of what this initial load is telling us, we know that there's additional sources from septic systems, and we know that there's additional sources from erosion events that cannot be detected from modeling alone. And there's additional sources from internal loading that's not at all factored into this load model. So that additional data is gonna be updated and including, included in the plan which brings me to stormwater sampling. So thank you so much to the Farm Pond volunteers. You guys are stellar. Uh, stormwater sampling is exactly like it sounds. You have to go out in a downpour event and try to capture the first flush of stormwater runoff in certain areas. So we've identified at least six continuous monitoring locations that the Farm Pond volunteers are going to and sampling in the middle of a storm. And uh, I think what the volunteers have seen is that even in places where there are structural um, improvements to route stormwater from a uh, road to a culvert and then maybe infiltrate it in a detention area, water has a mind of its own and sometimes due to either land settling, construction issues, or, or an erosive path over time, it forms its own preferential flows and there might be structural improvements needed to improve what's already there, as opposed to all full reconstruction in cir cer certain circumstances. Um, these concentrations of nutrients, so nitrogen and phosphorus, so the two primary nutrients that we're considering um, growth for plant and algae, and turbidity and suspended solids, those are all going to be improved via structural watershed improvements and the degree to which you are able to see improvements in farm pond from a specific project or from a number of specific specific projects over time um, depends on those initial load reductions. So you can monitor before and then you can monitor after to see how much has improved and also to help you estimate how you're going to see those changes over time in farm pond. I want to say here that I think it goes without saying that all construction presents a threat of erosion, but I think what a lot of people don't understand is that all erosion has high phosphorus. Um, so soil naturally has high phosphorus, particularly topsoil and finer soils. The majority of the phosphorus in soils is adsorbed onto clay surfaces, and clay surfaces and clay particles are oftentimes coating larger grains of sand. So sand usually has lower phosphorus than higher clay fraction types of soils or higher organic matter types of soils. Um, in situations where you have a topsoil erosion event, you can have astronomically high total phosphorus concentration values, which is what was measured at one of the site number six off of the Lake Street drain. Um, despite the fact that you have relatively low residential development, it doesn't mean that stormwater is not a problem. So this concentration of uh, over 1200 micrograms per liter, which equates to parts per billion of total phosphorus, is over 100 times higher than what is considered acceptable for in-lake conditions at Farm Pond. And because Farm Pond is a very low nutrient lake, it's more susceptible to those inputs of phosphorus than a lake that would have less clear water to begin with would. You'd see the change faster and it would be impacted more by those high concentrations. Um, the phosphorus that's coming in on these soil particles isn't necessarily immediately bioavailable. Some of it is, 
and some of it isn't. But when it settles out in the deeper waters, that phosphorus can become released from the soil particles and contribute to the internal load as well. So generally, erosion control practices are paramount to maintaining good water quality in farm pond. Uh, in terms of finding potential hotspots, in addition to stormwater sampling, you oftentimes find yourself looking for filamentous algae. So this is something that the farm pond volunteers have been really good about sending me pictures about where people are observing these filamentous green algae clouds. Uh, a reminder is that this is not cyanobacteria. This is just a filamentous chlorophyte algae. And oftentimes it grows in locations where there are high nutrient inputs from groundwater. It can grow on the surface of plants and rocks or the sediment surface, commonly called paraphyte in growth. But if it gets to a certain density, sometimes it can lift itself off and float around a little bit. So it's not always right where there is a local pollution source, but it tends to be in the vicinity. So during the 2023 aquatic plant survey, I also noted the filamentous algae presence. And you can see on this map that the majority of the filamentous algae presence and moderate to dense locations were along the western shore, usually in the areas where there are outfall culverts, a higher runoff and higher use from development, and more use from those publicly accessible areas. There's also a bunch of algae over here, which is right where there's a natural wetland input. And wetlands are great, but they also do put nutrients into um, a lake in, circum in certain circumstances. So groundwater inflows from wetlands will also sometimes cause algae growth. It's uncommon for algae to be present in large quantities in deep water, but it does happen. And I know that there's the groundwater aquifer that moves through here, and so it might have something to do with that as well. One of the things that I think, um, I think people are all aware of that peeing in the lake is not good for water quality, but little kids do it all the time. And there's, with the hundreds of people that are using the beach and the swimming area and the um, yacht club, I want to continue to encourage families that using the facilities are really important in terms of phosphorus and nitrogen nutrients, because those loading models don't account for all of the urine that might end up in the swim area. And we don't want that to be a problem moving forward. And we're trying to reduce nutrient loads everywhere else. It has to be said. Um, but if you're following up on these groundwater sources and these locations with filamentous algae, uh, seepage sampling for potential shoreline inputs is the way to go. So I'm gonna be doing this in June, 2024. So if you see me out there with these long skinny metal rods poking around on your shoreline, that's what I'm doing. Um, it's looking for natural background groundwater inputs, but also potential septic system plumes or plumes of high nutrients from the wetland inputs in various locations on the shore. And a lot of times because the nitrogen and phosphorus concentration sampling is very expensive, I start by doing in situ parameter monitoring. So things like dissolved oxygen, specific conductivity, temperature. These are going to A, verify that what I'm sampling is actually groundwater and that I'm not pulling lake water in accidentally. And then B, the specific conductivity could be indicative of a plume because there's high amounts of sodium chloride leaching that would show up in that conductivity. So a lot of times I'll be looking for a plume. If I find a high specific conductivity area, I'll take multiple samples, combine those, and then get an average for the phosphorus and nitrogen of a particular groundwater shore area. Uh, it conserves sampling budget and gets a higher shoreline inspection area done. And then of course, you're pulling this up into a sterile syringe and then filtering it. And in, cer in certain circumstances, if the dissolved oxygen indicates that it's relatively low in the groundwater area, that might mean that somebody's septic system, if it's near to that location, is not functioning properly because you need oxidized soils in order to treat uh, the phosphorus in the groundwater. So I'm gonna jump now into in-lake dynamics and show you guys some data. But first I wanted to make mention of 
phytoplankton and cyanobacteria blooms because that is really why we're all here trying to manage water quality because preventing cyanobacteria blooms means that you're able to swim in the lake and that it's safe for everyone to use and also that it's going to be clear temperature is what drives for the most part the phytoplankton pattern over the course of the season so what's present when is that seasonal succession and as you can see from this figure though oversimplified diatoms are a type of algae or type of phytoplankton that float in the water column and they tend to be present in the april spring period where the water column is the same temperature from the top to the bottom but as you progress throughout the season these blue greens or cyanobacteria have a competitive evolutionary advantage because they can control their cell buoyancy, which means that when you have the development of a thermocline, a lot of other types of phytoplankton will fall out and they'll just settle and die in the deeper waters. But cyanobacteria can rise to the surface, use their cell buoyancy control to overcome that thermocline and be the dominant type of phytoplankton in the water column for the majority of the summer season. Um, particularly in lakes like Farm Pond, where you have really, really stable thermocline conditions and stable stratification for most of the summer. And then as the season progresses, you have a uh, fall mixing event, and sometimes you have a combination of cyanobacteria and uh, fall diatom bloom as well. This is something that I think is really important uh, for everyone to understand, is that cyanobacteria blooms tend to to be full lake events, and that cyanobacteria taxa don't all occupy the same location in the water column. And lake to lake, the position in the water column prior to a bloom formation is not the same. So what we usually see from the 2023 data and what I've done for phytoplankton monitoring and looking at um, the uh, zooplankton toes versus surface algae samples, the phytoplankton and cyanobacteria tend to accumulate in the deeper waters, usually at the bottom of the thermocline, near what I consider the top of um, the zone that loses oxygen. So if there's a stable lake condition where you have the cyanobacteria floating at a specific depth and you have a major wind event or a major rain event or a heat wave, those are all things that impact temperature and impact the way that the lake water is moving and impacting density. That can disrupt cyanobacteria that previously were stable at a particular layer and cause them to overcompensate with their buoyancy and move to the surface. So that's why sometimes it seems like it's sudden, but what really happens is that the cyanobacteria are growing where we can't see them and then all of a sudden they end up at the surface. And sometimes it happens very rapidly. So this is some water clarity data from 2023, and I should preface this by saying that this is just my water quality readings. Uh, I haven't incorporated the farm pond volunteer data into this presentation, but it will be all in together for the watershed based plan. And this is a little different, I think, than the way that the volunteer reports have typically demonstrated clarity, but I set this up so that this Y axis is the lake depth. So zero meters at the surface here, and then the bottom at about 17 meters. And what you're seeing is that the depth of penetration of light to the visible Secchi disk, like we showed in the first presentation, is to about um, the six to eight meter range in farm pond historically and in 2023. There were a couple months where it wasn't quite six meters, but that's excellent. That's very, very, very good for water clarity. And of course, this is using a view scope. If you weren't gonna use a view scope, that would be uh, a lesser amount of clarity because the view scope shades out the light in your peripheral vision and allows you to see sort of like goggles deeper into the water column. Um, mesotrophic conditions that we spoke about, usually you don't get any higher than six meters of clarity. Uh, and as soon as you get less than two meters of clarity, your cyanobacteria are almost always the dominant phytoplankton in the water column, as particularly for the temperate lakes of the Northeast. I've included this figure here because it's just another explanation of the rapid change of water clarity associated with total phosphorus. So you have water clarity on this side, 
and then total phosphorus on the x-axis here. And this is from a large study of Connecticut lakes, but I've also done this figure and graphed all of the thousands and thousands of data points from the main lake data and long-term water quality monitoring data, and the pattern is very similar. Once you get over 10 micrograms per liter or parts per billion of phosphorus, you stop seeing greater than six meters of clarity. Once you get to 25, micrograms per liter of phosphorus, you almost always have less than two and a half meters of clarity. And so that change, that jump is very, very small. Um, and in order to maintain less than 10 micrograms per liter and keep those concentrations of nutrients very low in the surface waters, you have to end up addressing the deep water phosphorus. So this is something that hasn't been measured in the past as part of the long-term volunteer monitoring uh, program. But in 2023, I took a series of depth measurements. So you're monitoring not only the surface conditions, but also the conditions in the thermocline and also the nutrients in the hypolimion or the bottom water layer. And what you can see is that there's a steady increase in these bottom water samples. So this is the very bottom sample, about um, one meter off of the sediment surface. And then this is that 10 meters, so just at the bottom of the thermocline. And what you can see is that these concentrations are 40 and above. The highest concentration that was measured in the bottom was almost 190 micrograms per liter, meaning that as the nutrients accumulate down here, cyanobacteria have the competitive ability to regulate their buoyancy and go down and get some of those nutrients. So they can hover right where they have access to those nutrients. And then if you move the cyanobacteria to the surface, it can bring some of the nutrients it needs with it. So this is something that we need to keep an eye on because you're gonna to have to manage the deep water phosphorus in addition to the watershed phosphorus. Um, this figure here is demonstrating the surface area relative to the depth of the lake. So in terms of calculating the actual mass of phosphorus increase, you need to know the volume of water that you're dealing with. So Right here at the surface, the lake is about 126 acres. And then at the bottom, about 17 meters deep, you or 18 meters deep, you, you're zero. At about nine and a half meters, that is really the edge of your deep water hypolimion area. And that translates to roughly about 12% of the water volume and roughly about 35 acres or so. Um, I'm going to refine those. Uh, with data throughout the season because the actual hypolimion depth changes throughout the course of the season as well. But those numbers are how you get an actual mass increase, which is how you calculate the internal load and then verify that with the watershed-based models. Um, profiles are, so this is something that you've probably seen a number of times before, um, generally set up the same way where you have the zero surface of depth here and then along the, the y-axis, this is the bottom of the lake. And as you go through the course of the season, each one of these lines is a profile measurement from one date, measuring at one meter increments from the top to the bottom. And the surface water is warming a lot faster than the bottom water. So that's that thermocline there. In terms of long-term monitoring programs, this is great, but because the technology has come so far, we have this awesome high resolution half, half hour interval data loggers from all of these depths from 2023. And what we're looking for here is these short periods of stratification where you have the large separation of temperature from one depth to another in the upper water layers. And then when they come together for a mixing event here, so a lot of times when you're going out uh, sampling on a monthly basis, you miss these storm events. So you miss these partial water column mixing events here. And a lot of times it's those mixing events that correspond to something else, like a cyanobacteria bloom that you see in the water column. Similarly to the dissolved, or similar to, to the temperature, we also installed a dissolved oxygen sensor. And this is, dissolved oxygen concentration on this, this axis, and then dissolved oxygen um, percent saturation, which factors in the temperature. So in situations where there's colder water, you have a higher saturation for oxygen, 
than in warmer water because warmer water doesn't hold as much concentrated uh, dissolved oxygen. So to compensate for the temperature factor, you have to calculate the percent oxygen saturation. But I've displayed both of them on here for demonstra demonstration purposes. Um, we placed it at 10 meters, which demonstrates that you have a seasonal loss all the way from May to the middle or the end of, uh, sorry, the end of August. Um, and it wasn't until the end of August that that 10 meter depth completely lost dissolved oxygen. And that corresponded to what I consider to be the top or near the top of the anoxic zone throughout the course of the season. Um, and that depth was roughly where the cyanobacteria tended to hang out in a lot of cases. And as you can see here, there were a lot of partial mixing events where the lake was able to regain oxygen after it had gone anoxic. So that layer of anoxic boundary was sort of fluctuating based on environmental conditions. And then once lake turnover started, the temperature started to cool, you have the regaining of oxygen at 10 meters and then full water column turnover didn't happen until the end of November here, where all of the temperature from the deep waters um, were the same, again, from the top to the bottom, where all the lines converged. So what does that mean in terms of internal loading? It basically means that there's this large central area that has a surface area of at least 30 acres, probably more, because it extends in um, outwards to shallower water in certain circumstances of sediment that goes through a chemical process that allows phosphorus to migrate from the sediments and into the water column. So if we're going to move forward with cyanobacteria remediation, we can't ignore this large potential nutrient source here. Um, and in terms of a timeline, you should expect that monitoring is going to continue through November 2024, the data analysis process is going to be done by January and then by March 2025, you'll have a draft plan that will be reviewed by MassDEP and also via a public comment period. Uh, and then hopefully it's reviewed by MassDEP as a final copy sent to EPA for their review. And then once approved, you can start implementing and applying for additional funding for watershed improvement projects and non-point source pollution for internal controls. I think that's it. I'll take some questions. Hillary, can you talk about that out stormwater outflow pipe on Lake Street? Mm -hmm. Like, do you do you know, or is that something that um, we'd have to go to somebody else to get recommendations about how to control that? What we could do. So when that happened, it was a real time thing where I, I identified where it was coming from. Um, it was a known construction site on Lake Street where somebody was redoing their driveway and erosion control measures were not taken or they weren't good enough. And during a heavy rainfall event, actually multiple rainfall events, it overtopped their minimal erosion control practices and went directly onto the road and directly into Farm Pond. Um, I think that Tom at the time and Jean had contacted the Conservation Commission and they instructed the homeowner to do more to control the erosion. Um, but you can, there's only so much you can do after the fact, after it's been loaded. So that's why it's really important to, if you see something, say something and get Public Works involved and get the Conservation Commission involved because that's what they're for, to enforce those standards and preserve water quality. If I get, thank you, Hillary, Tom Trainer. If I could add to that, I think the uh, uh, construction at that property is uh, complete, and I I think the uh, the uh, on-site uh, stormwater uh, uh, barriers are are in place finally, and that property and and the driveway is paved. So hopefully, resampling of that drainage pipe. Uh, that goes directly in the farm pond at that dip on on Lake Street. Uh, the the numbers will be a lot a lot lower, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what 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 we get this year. Yes, Tom, this is Kath, um, Catherine Rocchio. We did sample 
that location at the end of March. Hillary, I don't know if you've ever, if you gotten a chance to look at those numbers, but we do I have- did. It was considerably lower. Yeah. Good. Um, but it's just to demonstrate that when construction happens, high phosphorus follows if you don't control erosion. Carol uh, Beardsley has her hand up. Hi. I'm going to guess that the answer to this is that you can't tell, but any chance there's a way to identify what the phosphorus is from, whether it's from detergents or fertilizer or soil, or it just reads as phosphorus and there's no differentiation. So if the water is very turbid, it's from soil erosion. Um, if the water is very clear in stormwater, but still has really, really high phosphorus, it's most likely from a dissolved form of phosphorus, and it's probably from fertilizers. And which did you witness? It, at that it? particular location, the water was very turbid and it was from erosion. Okay. I think Barry has the hand up too. It's actually Ellen Liebert. Oh, hi, Ellen. <laughs> um, hi. We live on the cove, which is on the other side of the berm. And we've noticed that the water level has gotten higher and higher this spring. And there are lots of nutrients in this cove. And the berm is it's not that big a divider between the pond and the cove. So I'm wondering, have you taken this into consideration or taken a look at the cove in as far as it relates to the pond? So I have not actually sampled in the cove pond itself, um, but I did verify the direction of flow was from farm pond out to the, the smaller pond over the berm. And there was some confusion about whether or not there was backflow and water going from one the smaller pond back into farm pond, but that was not what I observed when I was out there, which geologically there, and like hydrologically makes sense. But are there circumstances under which there could be flow in the other direction, such as if a tree was uprooted and the water? It, it would be unlikely but yes it probably it, the the berm could flow both directions during very low drought conditions um through the berm though it wouldn't be going over the berm um or if the berm was breached in any way there would be a large amount of mixing yeah i'll add uh this is michael uh that the part of what you're seeing in that cove um is that there's some beaver activity there and that uh, somebody's going to is looking and, uh, that they're looking to put in some sort of water leveling device so that uh, so that the water level is better controlled. Um, but I think that's what you're seeing in this particular season. Um, so hopefully that will get addressed. Who are you referring to when was, you say, when you say someone is looking? I'm referring to the Willises. Uh, oh. So who uh, have that, uh, who have that, the outlet from that cove goes, is in their property. And so they're looking into uh, trying to deal with that issue with the, for the beavers. There's a lodge that's on the uh, cove side of the berm, a beaver lodge, I mean there. Uh, so hopefully that will be addressed fairly soon. I think Marianne has their hand up as well. Yes, th thank you, Hillary. Um, e excellent work. I really enjoyed seeing those those mixing events that you captured. You know, during the during this stratified season. Um, I guess my my question is, and I think I know the answer. If you were if you were to to estimate, given the data that you have it in hand, is is the internal loading a greater source? Of phosphorus and consequently these blooms or stimulating these blooms, then then inputs from the watershed. 
So I hesitate to say yes, because long term, the watershed is also very important to control nutrient sources. And I don't want to p give people the false assumption that it's not. But yes, mm -hmm. I think that historically, the internal load at Farm Pond has been dramatically underestimated. And it's also important to consider that the majority of the form of nutrients from the internal load is more directly available to cyanobacteria mm -hmm. because it's in a bioavailable form and it's also right where they need it when they need it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so with, let me add something else here. Um, I, I agree with you, you know, best, best practices in the watershed are absolutely essential now going forward because of climate change. And what I'm thinking here is more storm events, you know, very heavy storm events are projected to occur as our climate continues to warm. And those are going to trigger these mixing events, you know, during the stratified season that can basically bring those nutrients up into the surface waters. So I agree, you know, the watershed, the, the water, we absolutely have to um, minimize any input from the watershed. Um, but I think that um, somehow dealing with this internal load is, is going, is going to be important as well. Yeah, so lucky for us, the state of Massachusetts considers internal load a non-point source pollution, and there's precedent for using the Section 319 and 604B um, funding for internal loading controls. Uh, in other states that I've worked in, the 319 grant funds have not been used for in, in lake controls, only for watershed controls. But because the original source of the nutrients was from the watershed to some degree, mm -hmm. um, and it's just mm -hmm. internally recycling now, Massachusetts right. does allow it. Okay, great. That's good to know. Thank you. I see Tom has his hand up too. And I unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much, Hillary. Very uh, impressive to see all that data graph now. I was curious about that uh, new uh, groundwater sampling you hope to do this season. Uh, what what lake lake depths do you do that in generally, and how many uh, data points do you hope to uh, to do? Um. I don't know exactly how many data points I'm going to be able to do. I think in the budget, I had budgeted for up to like 30 um, sites. Uh, but if I'm able to do more in the same time period, I will. Um, and I'll do just more in situ monitoring to try to identify the major path of a potential plume if there is one to be seen. And uh, the first part of your question, so the majority of the shallow groundwater that's coming in is coming in very close to shore. So like in less than three feet of water. So that's where I'm gonna be doing the majority of the sampling. If if you were to go to one of the uh, maps that you showed, do you, do you have an idea right now where you're planning to do those samples? Yeah, so it's going it's going to be along the Western shore. It's gonna be along Pretty, I'm going to try to cover most of the shore, to be honest, um, and spacing it out relatively evenly. But I'm looking for places that are near septic systems along shore, and I'm looking for places near wetlands along shore where there's a potential high um, groundwater input to a larger volume of um, water coming through groundwater because there's a higher amount of watershed area for that subbasin. And then I'm also going to go and verify what was previously done along the northeastern coast and to demonstrate is that actually a place where groundwater moves out through farm pond. So looking at like negative hydraulic head there. Interesting. Can I can I ask another question? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and you didn't get a chance uh, to cover it uh, here tonight, but we get a, lo a lot of questions about aquatic plants uh, in farm pond. Can you just make some general statements about uh, our, our plant community and maybe compare it to other lakes uh, you've worked on? Yeah, so the overall farm pond plant community um, is there's no invasives. That's great. And it is typical of an oligotrophic system where you have very low growing aquatic plants. So you have 
I'll show you eventually in the maps. I know Tom has seen them, but I don't, I know, don't think everybody has, but Eleocris, Acicularis, and Sagittaria graminia are two types of plants that are very low growing. They're only like a few inches tall off the sediment surface, and they cover the majority of the bottom in the shallow water areas at Farm Pond. Those don't really need that many nutrients to support their growth, as opposed to large pondweed species or potamogeton species need a lot more nutrients. And so as the lake gains nutrients and becomes more eutrophic and has higher groundwater inputs of nutrients, also accumulating higher amounts of organic material in the shallow sediments, that type of sediment and nutrient accumulation is going to grow bigger and more robust plants over the long term. So in if you consider um, like 10 to 20 years a long time, lakes in the um, Connecticut, Massachusetts area tend to grow more plants over time. And if they started out with minimal plant growth, you can expect higher plant growth over that time, pan, that time span. Um, one of the most dominant things that is present right now in the deeper water, so I think mostly deeper than about six feet, is uh, nitella, which is not actually a plant. It's a plant-like macroalgae which is a, it grows in all sorts of lakes, but it becomes the more dominant form of plant growth, if you will, or bottom cover in what I've seen as oligotrophic lakes. And I feel like it sort of is the precursor to aquatic plants in a lot of ways, but it's also capable of growing in deeper water too than most plants. Thank you. Yes, I have fall. Following up on Tom's thing, I had two other questions, but so there's this increased uh, plant growth that's to be expected. Is that going to, how does that overlap or not with the other the general water quality and the whole issues of dealing with nutrients? Yeah, so generally, if you can control the watershed nutrient inputs, you will have less settling in the shoreline area. So if you have less organic matter coming from and less nutrients coming from the watershed, you're going to have less settling and less sediment accumulation. And less sediment accumulation means less plants and less nutrients for plants. So in coves where you have like a two inch layer of organic sediment, that gives the plants more nutrients to grow denser and more robustly. If you have a shoreline that's relatively sandy or gravelly and there hasn't been a steady accumulation of organic matter, then it's much less likely to grow high density of aquatic plants. Mm -hmm. uh, coming back to the other, well, my other questions of <coughs> you're still going around, can you, you're, you're able to discern the possible uh, input from septic systems? You can discern that versus just the general groundwater? Sometimes, uh, yeah. So the goal would be to do it right after a rain event so that there's actually shallow groundwater moving through the system. Um, and I've done it at lakes where the septic systems are usually more numerous and more uh, some, usually closer to the shoreline than a lot of the ones at Farm Pond. But in certain circumstances, it's like night and day where the concentrations of background phosphorus and nitrogen will be fairly low and fairly normal. And then you have like an order of a hundred times higher for plumes of septic systems. Wow. Um, the other thing is maybe I'm getting ahead of it. Uh, the the phosphorus that's in the lake, I guess, which is a big issue. Well, obviously, probably a big issue. What are what do you what are the range of approaches to even dealing with that? Um, that, will, that will come up. In your next yeah, so <laughs> it's a little too early to talk about that because there's a number of uh, ways that you can control internal loading. Um, the common ones that people talk about are either locking phosphorus with some type of a mineral, so whether it's a, a um, mineral that's not subjected to the anaerobic dissolution like iron is, so like iron-bound phosphorus comes out of the sediments, but aluminum and lanthanum-bound phosphorus can stay in the sediments even under anaerobic conditions. And then there comes the factor of, well, do you also want to try to take care of the habitat and 
do an aeration project in the lake because then you would have better dissolved oxygen and suppressing the release of internally loaded nutrients. Um, I think that there's generally a misconception that an aeration system is going to solve all of your internal loading problems, but that doesn't account for the fact that oxidizing that micro layer of sediment surface is extremely difficult and most aeration projects are not capable of doing it well. Mm, okay. I guess we'll see what works for us uh, at some point. Thank you. No, it's a great talk. Thanks. Melinda? Hey, Hillary, can you speak to that? Because that whole mixing thing I find so confusing. Because on the one hand, I'm like, oh, great, we're mixing, we're bringing the cold water up so that'll, you know, cool it off and sort of, you know, bring it, bring the, the temperature down, you know, which would, I'm theorizing, like, would benefit us in that it would, you know, help with water clarity and all the rest of that. But Not then quite. I also hear... But you're also, you know, at the same time bringing the phosphorus back up from the internal loading and and like, can you unpack that? I feel like you just yeah. touched on it too with the aeration. Like, how does that stuff? Yeah. So, what, what do we want? I think that there's a general misconception that the bottom of the lake has cleaner water, which is like almost never true. Um, usually, the closer you get to the sediment surface and in deeper water, the water has more dissolved components in it. It has um, higher nutrient concentrations. And in some cases, at, like at Farm Pond in the end of the summer, you also have anaerobic gases. So like if you were to take a sample from the deep water, you would smell hydrogen sulfide um, and it smells like rotten eggs. So the water down there is definitely not cleaner than the surface waters of Farm Pond. Uh, and it just has to do with the fact that it stays for the most part down there and then there's little burps of mixing events that will bring some of those nutrients up to the surface before fall turnover. Um, and at fall turnover there's also a period of partial oxidation so oxygenation is happening and some of those nutrients are going to re-precipitate out and resettle so they're not all going to be immediately used by algae during fall turnover. Um, luckily fall turnover is also not the period of time in the season where cyanobacteria tend to dominate. So a lot of times those fall blooms are not always cyanobacteria. Um, in general, the, the partial mixing events don't do anything to improve the lake temperature or anything that you were saying. It was, it's that the partial mixing events can dip down, extend the epilimnetic volume, and then move some of the nutrients from the deep waters into the surface water so that they can be used by algae. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? Did I answer that enough? Yeah, it does. It just makes me sad because I always say, <laughs> I had the misconception that we like the mixing, right? Because it, I, I thought that it had like, you know, some value to help oxygenate and again, and like cool the, te the temperatures overall, but not so, so much. The fact that the pond loses oxygen during the season is pretty normal. Like almost all water bodies of the same size and shape of the Northeast of Farm Pond lose oxygen. Unless there's an extremely large volume of water down there, there's not enough oxygen to sustain and prevent dissolved oxygen complete loss in the course of a summer season. Um, it's also important to know that some of the nutrients are going to stay down there. Not all of them are going to make their way to the surface. So the fact that there's nutrients down there isn't inherently a problem. It's that, that some of them are used by cyanobacteria and migrate to the surface. And even if we were to try to do a internal loading control project, it's not going to solve it forever, right? Because there's continuously watershed nutrient input sources that are still going to be settling down there. Uh, so that's something to factor in when we're planning for remediation, like how many years out are we planning for? Are we planning for 10 years, five years, 20 years, those kind of things. Um, in terms of mixing, spring and fall, full water column mixing is just normal. That's just like, it's not that it's good or bad. It's just normal to have the temperature be the same from the top to bottom in the spring and the top to bottom again in the fall. Um, I guess it's 
better in the sense that it will reoxygenate the whole bottom. Um, and it's better in the sense that it's not going to give cyanobacteria a competitive advantage. But I would argue that if the lake was mixing for the entire summer season, water quality would be worse than it is during the summer um, with the stratification present. Because keep in mind that when the water column is really stable, a lot of the stuff will start to fall out of the water column besides cyanobacteria, which means that you have clearer conditions in the surface waters, the new wood, if it was actually mixing the entire summer. So where does aeration fall into that? Uh, so there's so many different kinds of aeration, um, aeration and oxygenation systems. I, I don't think I can really start to scratch the surface right now without some pretty detailed diagrams, but I can make note of that question and make sure that I can explain it in detail the next time. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think the take home is that aeration works sometimes for specific types of water bodies and the type of aeration or oxygenation system that you would select is based on the volume of water you're trying to, to aerate and based on the depth and the shape of your lake, because you don't want to bring that poor quality water to the surface. So if you were or to do a full water column mixing, just like a normal destratification aeration system like you do in a small pond, that could make farm pond like catastrophically bloom with cyanobacteria because it probably is not gonna be enough to overcome that density gradient. And Daryl, I see you have another question. Yeah, so I've noticed over the years that it seems to me that the uh, slippery growth that's on the bottom and on rocks in the pond has gotten thicker or more prevalent. I don't even know if that's a, a negative thing. So that might be one part of the question is, is it? And if so, might any efforts we make to improve conditions address that? So when paraphyte and growth, like you're referring to, so like the slippery algae growing on rocks, Excuse me. <laughs> a lot of talking. I still have a cold here. Um, when that's happening, it's because the algae has the nutrients to grow in the first place. So if there were lower nutrient concentrations in the water column or in the sediment substrate where they're growing, they wouldn't be able to get as dense. So if you take care of the nutrients coming into the lake and in the lake, from internal, internal sources it should also help with that. <clears throat> okay, so those aren't necessarily beneficial to other aquatic life then? Well, so sort of. So oligotrophic lakes like farm pond aren't meant to have a robust aquatic life community, right? So like a robust aquatic life community with ample fish, ample aquatic invertebrates, um, a really high productivity level also require a lot of algae and plants and nutrients. Um, that's why people fertilize fishing ponds. Right, so they're trying to get their fish to grow bigger and fatter and to put more and more nutrients into the system to support that higher trophic level growth. We don't want that for farm pond because farm pond is not a little fishing pond. Um, it is a naturally nutrient poor water body and we should manage it as such. Thank you. Maybe I'm like everybody else. Define allotropic or whatever uh, that you were using the term for this pond, just to refresh our memories. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so oligotrophic is simply indicating a class of lakes. Um, so oligotrophic is low nutrients. Mesotrophic is moderate nutrients. Eutrophic is high nutrients. And the low oligotrophic nutrient conditions are indicative of clear water and good secchi clarity 
and low aquatic plant growth and low algae growth. The mesotrophic, moderate plant growth, moderate algae growth, moderate water quality. And then eutrophic is very high plant growth, high um, phytoplankton and algae growth, and high productivity. Thanks. I don't think I see anybody else's questions. Does anybody else have something you want to add or concerns or anything? I can do just a quick other pop in. Um, maybe just a comment on um, like washing down boats and watercraft. We didn't mm. talk a lot about that business and the, its yeah, usefulness so and how important it is. It doesn't take more than one tiny piece of an invasive plant to colonize in your lake. Um, I have seen situations where a kayak wasn't washed and it went into a lake that didn't have any invasive plants and washed off. And that started a new community of invasives right next to the boat ramp where it was dropped. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've seen a lake that didn't have invasives end up with invasives 10 years later in this career. And it's very, very difficult once they have established themselves to stop them from spreading because plants grow very quickly and they fragment and, sh and will travel long distances and end up popping everywhere. So plant management with invasives is a pain in the butt. And it's almost like a game of whack-a-mole. Even if you catch it early, you're still going to be constantly managing it. So the best way to prevent that from happening is to not put it in the lake in the first place. Okay, I think that's it then. Thank you so much. Sorry, it's great. Yeah, thank you everybody. I hope you guys got something out of this and enjoy the rest of your evening. And I it will hope great. to talk to you again soon. Thanks, Hillary. Thank, thank you, you very much. Bye. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Hillary. Mm -hmm.